I'm delighted that you're here and I hope you have your Bible with you. We'll get to some Bible text here in just a few moments. I want you to bear with some quotation and some information before we get to the Bible text because we're going to be dealing with a subject that is somewhat confusing to many of us, self-included, and you'll see why in just a moment. I've been asked if I would deal with the doctrine of Gnosticism. What is that? What's that all about? You hear us sometimes in teaching a Bible class say that this probably refers to a Gnostic idea or Gnostic thought or an incipient form of Gnosticism. What are we talking about? And what is all of that about? So I've been asked if I would deal with that in light of the implications of Gnosticism or reference to that perhaps scattered through the book of 1 Timothy, which we are studying, and 2 Timothy as well. Those are not the only books, but we are going to see probably as much or more reference in Timothy than we do some of the other books. And so we'll come to those passages, but get some background before we get to those passages will be helpful to us. So let's start with this. Just what is Gnosticism? When I get through giving the definition of Gnosticism, if you're still scratching your head saying, I'm not sure I understand fully, then join the club and get behind me because I'm right there with you. We do understand a great deal about Gnosticism, but you'll see why we don't as we go forward. Uh, Don't have a full, complete, crystal clear understanding. It's not like Calvinism, for example, can boil it down to five points. Here are the points of Calvinism. Here are the implications of Calvinism, we got it. That's not the case with Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from, uh, that word Gnosticism, that was not used in the Bible. You don't find that word in the Bible, but the word from which it comes is found in the Bible. The Bible, the word for knowledge is the word gnosis, and it just simply means knowledge. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 20, we read about knowledge. We'll come to that. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want. But you find the word knowledge there, and it is from this word gnosis. And so the idea of being a Gnostic is you claim to have superior knowledge. And so we have several references in the Bible to those who might claim to have superior knowledge. Now bear with some quotations. I don't know of a better way to approach this than to give some quotations from several sources. The clinic and Strong said this about Gnosticism. It took up the facts which were the objects of common faith and made them subjects of speculation and profound thought. There was a great deal of speculation with reference to Gnostic thought. The same source said the latter claim to be above the reach of the vulgar and to be derived from sources superior to the written word. And so in the New Testament times, and even in our own day, and we'll talk about modern day Gnosticism in a moment or toward the end of our study, but in New Testament times, when you had the revelation of God, we have the complete revelation. You read and you understand and you, you have this knowledge. But the Gnostics claim to have something far superior to what could be gained from the revelation of God, a superior form of knowledge. The ISBE said it involves, as the name denotes, a claim to knowledge. Knowledge of a kind which the ordinary believer was incapable and in possession of which salvation in the full sense consisted. In Christianity, when we talk about the goal and we talk about what we are shooting for and what God's goal for us is, has to do with salvation and serving God. But the goal, we'll get to in a few moments, has to do with gaining this knowledge and what that knowledge will accomplish. It is vague to say the least. That is, what is this knowledge all about? What is this knowledge? What does it consist of? Bo Kirkwood, who is an elder in the Lord's Church, a faithful member of the church, wrote a book called The Unveiling uh, the Da Vinci, Unveiling the Da Vinci Code. I'll talk more about, more about the Da Vinci Code, uh, that book, a little bit later. But, but the Kirkwood said, What is very vague in Gnostic literature is defining exactly what Gnosis or acquaintance is. Is it the accepting of Gnostic theology and cosmology? Or is it some other higher form or insight into one's being? We don't know. Furthermore, it is not detailed as to how one actually achieves this Gnosis or acquaintance. 
Perhaps if you delved more into the depths of the Gnostic literature, you would gain that. But what I've been able to read thus far, I found, haven't found anything that suggests you go through this process and you will gain this knowledge. And you have this knowledge that is deeper and richer and higher. If, how do you gain that? I, I want to be a Gnostic, for example. And how do I gain this knowledge? It's kind of vague as to how that all comes about. Well, furthermore, the goal of the Gnostic thought is redemption. And you say, well, that sounds like Christianity. That's what we're after, and that's what God is after, and that's what the Bible teaches. But it's not redemption as we think of it. That is redemption from sin. Bear again with a quotation or two. This is from the Lexham Bible Dictionary. It said, the Gnostic goal is to attain salvation from the fallen physical world in which they are trapped through the obtaining the secret knowledge or gnosis. Gnostics believe that Gnosis frees the divine spark within humans, allowing it to return to the divine realm of light. Gnostics likewise believe that when all elect Gnostics have been restored through Gnosis, that is knowledge, the physical world will be destroyed and the chosen humans will return to the divine state. Sounds like the New Age movement, doesn't it? Salvation is thus initially brought about by Gnosis, but ultimately consists of a return of the human soul to the divine realm in which it belongs. Sounds like reincarnation, doesn't it? The Gnostics took over the idea of redemption through Christ, not the full Christian doctrine, for they made it rather redemption of the philosophers from matter than redemption of mankind from sin. So when they talk about redemption, they're not talking about redemption from sin. You have sinned and you've fallen from God and you need to be saved from sin. But you're being saved from evil and evil is matter. Matter is evil. All matter is evil, in fact. One other quotation along that line. Gnosticism puts knowledge in the place of what only rightly could be occupied by Christian faith. To the Gnostic, the great question was not, the uh, intensely practical one, what must one do to be saved from sin, or what, uh, but what is the origin of evil? That's a big question in Gnosticism. Where did evil come from? We'll get to that in a moment. How is the primitive order of the universe to be restored? In the knowledge of these and similar questions is the answer given to these questions. There was redemption as the Gnostics understood it. That is, they talk again about redemption, but you're being redeemed from, from evil in the sense of matter. And you are being absolved into the divine. That is part of the concept of Gnosticism. One of the big questions is where did it start? And so where can we point to and say, where did this idea start? Well, here, McLennick and Strong said, no question, however, is more perplexed historian than with that which refers to the direct origins of Gnosticism. And so we can't find a conclusive answer as to the exact origins of it. Kirkwood said that there is evidence that almost certainly Gnosticism existed centuries before the birth of Christ, although no one can give a precise date where it began. No one can say it began in 300 B.C., 400 B.C., or 4 B.C. When did it begin? No one can point to that. Now, we can point to the fact that Plato, from, who was from 428 to 348 B.C., so that's long before Christ, he espoused an element of Gnosticism. Now, was that called Gnosticism or was it something that finally grew into the Gnostic thought? But here is what Plato himself said. But a man who has given his heart to learning and true wisdom, that sounds like Gnosticism, doesn't it? And exercise that part of himself is surely found if he attains to the truth to have immortal and divine thoughts and cannot fail to achieve immortality as fully as permitted to human nature. That sounds a whole lot like Gnosticism, doesn't it? And that has been attributed to the Gnostic thought. It has been argued that Gnosticism began within Christianity. And so you had Christianity, and as an outgrowth of that, and by coming out of Christianity, it doesn't mean that Christianity endorsed it, but you might argue that Catholicism came from Christianity and the corruption that developed finally into the Christian church. And so it's been argued that it came out of Christianity, that Christianity was there and then Gnosticism was formed out of that. It didn't begin with Christianity, but I want to suggest it was influenced by and had influence on Christianity. How so? It was influenced by Christianity in that they took some of the principles of Christianity and tweaked them and perverted them and adopted some of those principles into the Gnostic thought, though it existed prior to Christianity. 
How did it influence Christianity? Well, the fact that the New Testament alludes to some principles that we would label as Gnostic thought suggests that it was a threat to the Christians, that is a threat to the church. And so there were some Christians who had been influenced by the Gnostic thought. Again, I quote from the Lexham Bible Dictionary. That Gnosticism shared some characteristics with Judaism and Christianity, but remained mark markedly distinct from either. It was neither Christianity nor Ju Judaism, in other words. Traditionally, Gnosticism was thought to have emerged from within Christianity. Recent scholarship, however, has acknowledged that Gnosticism may have been existing, an existing belief that not only came into an, uh, contact with Christianity, uh, may have been an existing belief that only later came in contact with Christianity. That is, it already existed, as we've argued, and that it later came in contact with Christianity. Right now, I'm beginning to get a better picture. I know the idea of knowledge and have a general idea that it existed before the time of Christ, but I want to suggest to you that it flourished in the second century, by the second century at least, and that's why some think that Gnosticism began in the second century, but it only flourished then. Kirkwood suggested that Gnosticism began to flourish in the late first and early second centuries. It didn't begin there, but it flourished during that time. We have Gnostic writings to, which tell us much about that. Now, one of the things that's become exciting to those who want to study Gnosticism was the discovery at Nag Hammadi in Egypt in 1945, similar to what we think of as the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were numerous Gnostic Gospels, and I put them in quotations. They call them Gospels. And in their mind, they are not only equivalent to, but superior to the Gospels we have in the New Testament. And these Gnostic Gospels, a picture of those, Dan Brown in his book called The Da Vinci Code claims that there were 80. Some think that's an exaggerated number. I don't know. Maybe it was. But we have such Gospels, and this is only a sampling of those. There's the Gospel of Philip, there's the Gospel of Thomas, and there's the Gospel of Mary. And so what have we learned so far? What kind of keep us, if we can keep us all together as we make our tour through Gnosticism. We know what Gnosticism is. It is the claim of superior knowledge. Where do we get that? I don't know. How do you get it? I'm not sure. But it's superior to anything you get out of the New Testament, we're told. And we don't know exactly where it started, but seemingly in, uh, long before the time of Christ, it flourished by the second century, and we can get access to what they think from many of the Gospels, as they call it, and from the Gnostic writings. I'm more interested in what they teach. And so there is some confusion with reference to what they teach. It's hard to point, pinpoint these are the doctrines. For example, as I already mentioned as a parallel, uh, if you ask me what is Calvinism involved, I can name five basic principles, and those are the basic elements of, of Calvinism. And so there's not seven principles or not eight principles. There's, there's five basic principles of Calvinism. Not so with the idea of Gnosticism. The difficulty in dealing with Gnosticism, this is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, is that it was not a homogenous system of either religion or philosophy, but embraced many widely diversified sects holding opinions drawn from a great variety of sources. The infinitely varied shapes assumed by the system renders it almost impossible to classify them or even to give an account of their leading ideas which shall not be open to objection. We might as well try to classify the products of the tropical jungle or the shapes or the hues of the sunset clouds or try to cha uh, which change under the view as we look at them. In other words, it, th th there's so many tentacles that come with this idea of Gnosticism, you can't even classify them all. And so we're not even going to attempt to do that. So let's talk about some of the basic concepts. What did they think about God and about creation? Well, they have a very perverted view of God. I'm not going to get into that so much as I am interested in the perverted view of creation at this juncture. Um, you can read the Da Vinci Code or the reviews of the Da Vinci Code and get some of the ideas of their perverted view of God. But their idea was that the world was not created directly by God and could not be. That would be impossible for God to do that. In fact, the world was created and made by lower power. That's a term that McClinic and Strong used to describe the Gnostic thought. That the world was created by a lower power. And that the problem with that is trying to wrestle with the origin of evil. If God created the world, and their assumption is that all matter is evil. We'll come to that in a moment. All matter is evil. And if God created the world directly, then God created evil. And so God couldn't have done that. And so they wrestle with this problem of evil time and again. 
So their concept is that there was a series of intermediate beings between God and matter. So you have God over here, and you have matter that was created, but God didn't directly do that. There are several intermediate beings. Some think they're angels. Some think they're some divine being that's lower than God, and then you keep getting lower, and 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 I can't go on for how many lowers you get till finally the, that lower, lower, lower being creates the matter over here. Those are called emanations or eons. And so there's a series of those. And so God created the world, but he did it by this series of things intermediate beings and depending on which Gnostic you talk to all oh, it was an angel no it was a lower form of deity whatever it may be but there's a series of beings in the creation of the world now let's talk about what the Bible teaches the Bible teaches in contrast to that and we have every evidence the Bible is inspired of God that God created the world and he created it directly God said let there be light and there was light God created the animals so Genesis chapter 1 you are familiar with Genesis chapter 1 we don't have to take the time to trace all of that, but I want to give you just a sampling of what God did in Genesis chapter 1. For example, let's take um, day 5. On day 5, God uh, created the birds. For example, at verse 21, great God created the sea creatures. The text said God created the sea creatures. And he said it was good. So here is matter. They say it's evil. The sea creatures would be evil. The cattle be evil. Man is evil. Flesh is evil. All matter is evil. But God created that. In Psalm 33, God spoke it and it was done. There's no indication that there was great emanations that lasted for great eons of time. Well, that's their concept about God and about creation. Well, what is their doctrine concerning Christ and Jesus? And I put those as separate because Christ and Jesus are not one and the same, according to their concept. Their idea was that Christ could not come in the flesh. The one that was prophesied of the Old Testament, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Redeemer of mankind, could not come in the flesh because all matter and flesh is evil. It goes back to that principle and that basis of their concept. All matter is evil. But John 1 and verse 14 said that the Word, which is identified in chapter 1 and verse 1, we'll come to that a little bit later, that was deity, was made flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, contrary to the Gnostic thought. So thus, because of that concept, Jesus in the flesh was not the Christ. So this Jesus of Nazareth that was walking on earth, there's no one would deny that Jesus was walking on earth. There was a man named Jesus who claimed to be the Christ and the Messiah. He was not the Christ, nor was he the Messiah at all. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny the virgin birth because that would argue something divine in connection with matter. Again, all matter is evil. We'll come back to that a little bit later. They deny the resurrection of Christ. In fact, the Gnostics hold that a literal view of the resurrection is the faith of fools. If you believe Jesus was literally raised from the dead, you're a fool according to Elaine Pagels, who was a Gnostic. They claim the secret. Now this is, if you read the Da Vinci Code, and some of you have read it or watched the movie, the big hidden secret that Christianity tried to hide, and Christianity tried to keep this hidden because they didn't want the secret out. That's their view. The big secret that was let out of the bag by the discovery of the codices of, at uh, 1945 in Egypt was that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a relationship. That is a sexual relationship. And because, now again, he's not divine, so don't get excited that the, the deity is having some kind of relationship. He's not divine, but he had a relationship with Mary Magdalene, is the idea. Well, here's what G the Bible teaches about Jesus. The Bible teaches that Jesus is divine. Hebrews chapter 1 and in verse 8, the Father said to the Son, now this was not the, the origin of Christianity, in their mind, some men got together and said, we're going to create Christianity, and we've got a purpose behind that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But this was God the Father said, thy throne, O God, is forever and forever. The Father referred to the Son as God. John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the one that was made flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14. 
Romans 1 and verse 4, he was declared to be the Son of God, that's deity, divine, by the resurrection from the dead. So that argues for his resurrection and, divine, and the fact that he is the divine Son of God. But that's their concept. Now you're going to understand more about that when we get to 1 Timothy in just a few moments. But let's list another concept. This is kind of the root concept and the base concept of Gnostic thought, and that is that all matter is evil. Now, as it is true in some, and I'm going to put in quotations, Christian theology, there are those who hold to a doctrine and then they go several different directions and opposing directions. Not all the same people, but one will go in this direction and one will go in another. The same thing happens here. How so? Well, they say, for example, because all matter is evil, that's why God could not directly create matter. So that is the basis for the doctrine of creation. All matter is evil, and so God could not have created that. That's why Christ could not have come in the flesh. So this Jesus of Nazareth walking around, I know he's not deity because all matter is evil. He's evil because he's, he's in the flesh. So he couldn't be the divine son of God. He could not be God himself. So because all matter is evil, on the one hand, the actions in the flesh don't matter to God. Because your flesh is evil. And it's going to do evil because all matter is evil. And so it doesn't matter what you do. And I would think I would have a tendency, if I bought into Gnosticism, I would think, okay, my flesh is matter and all matter is evil. It's evil anyway, so I'll do whatever I want to do. It doesn't matter to God what I do. And there were some Gnostics who thought that. Now let's look at 1 John 3 and verse 6, and perhaps John is talking about this Gnostic thought. Uh, so turn with me to 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 6. Does God care what you do in the flesh? Does God care about that at all? Whoever abides in him, this is 1 John 3 and in verse 6, does not sin, and whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now we'll come back to 1 John a little bit later and talk about maybe the influence of Gnosticism on the writing of John, or why John may have written some things he wrote. So that's the one hand. On the other hand, they practiced asceticism. Extreme self-denial. Because all matter is evil, you deny yourself of the, of the extreme. And we're coming back to Colossians 2. That's the passage that talks about touch not, taste not, handle not. There are certain things we cannot have and we cannot participate in. We see in 1 Timothy the same thing of forbidding to marry. This asceticism where you have extreme self-denial because all matter is evil. Well, those are contradictory thoughts. So some Gnostics go in that direction. Other Gnostics would go in the opposite direction. So you had some. What did they believe? Well, they believed both. It depends on which part. It, it had so many tentacles. Some would hold to the one hand and some would hold to the other. Now, feminism is also a, a heavy part of the Gnostic thought. How so? According to the Da Vinci Code, Kirkwood argues, that Christianity was invented to suppress women to turn people from the divine feminine. You stop and think about that. This popular book that came out in 2003, the, the premise of that and part of the problem with that is that he says Christianity basically was invented by man to suppress women. And that the role of women, and so the, the whole idea of Gnosticism is to exalt feminism. And that's part of the purpose of the book. They claimed that Jesus wanted Mary Magdalene to actually be the real leader of the church. That he didn't want to be himself, but he wanted to put her forth as the real leader of the church. They claimed that Old Testament Israel worshipped a male god, Jehovah, and a female counterpart, Shekinah. There is no evidence of that in the Old Testament. There's no evidence of that cited, except that Brown, in his book, Da Vinci Code, argues that or assumes that. But they think that, and they, they claim that there is this female, there's this male God that was worshipped, but there's also this female God. And so there's this advancement of feminism. I only make one reference here in light of our class this morning. The Bible teaches the submission of women. That was not invented by some men who decided we want to form Christianity. This was God himself speaking by inspiration. We read this morning, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Well, that's not the only passage that argues that, but we find that even in the very beginning in Genesis 3 and in verse 16. Here's another concept of Gnosticism, and that is the doctrine of reincarnation. Uh, knowledge, we are told, 
frees one from the bonds of the material, that is the matter. So if you do not have this gnosis or knowledge or acquaintance, and again, I don't know how you get that. I don't know how you acquire that. But if you don't have that, then you're left out. We'll come how you're left out in a moment. But if you do have that, what it does is it frees you from this evil of matter and the material. How does that work? Well, if you, if you, don't, if you accept it, you're free. But if you don't accept it, then you're reincarn reincarnated back to some form on earth. So you have people talking about what they were in their former life, and now they've been reincarnated, and they think they came back as some lower life. Well, you came back as, as another form of evil. You were evil, and you are another form of evil, because all matter is evil. Again, that's the basis of this idea of you know, reincarnation. I want to suggest to you that 1 Corinthians 15 argues for the resurrection of, in the end of time. The whole chapter argues that there is a general resurrection in the end of time. Reincarnation denies there is a resurrection. Because if you don't be absolved into the divine, which is really the new age movement, if you're not absolved into the divine, then you're going to be reincarnated, and then you'll be reincarnated, and you'll be reincarnated until finally you gain this knowledge. So I guess you really don't have to worry about this knowledge. You say, why don't I need to worry about it if, if I wanted to be a Gnostic? Because if you've got it, you're going to be absolved into the divine ultimately. If you don't have the knowledge, you're just going to be reincarnated, given another chance. And then you'll be reincarnated and given another chance. So don't worry about it. And maybe you'll get that knowledge somewhere along the line. Now, let's, that, that is not a list of all the doctrines. I'm just trying to give you just a flavor of the doctrine. Now, let's talk about uh, Gnosticism referenced in the New Testament. Now, when we talk about it being referenced in the New Testament, we're not talking about a passage that mentions the Gnostic by name, like the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, or maybe the doctrine of the uh, Pharisees. Uh, we don't find that. But we have some passages that I must just say that they seem to allude to Gnostic thought. So let's start. And this is why I was asked to deal with this, is because of the implication in Timothy. And so I may come across one, you say, I'm not convinced that's, that's referring to Gnosticism. Okay, then have at it. I'm not sure I, I have a, a basis to argue in detail. But I think we can make a case that these probably allude, if Gnosticism existed three or four hundred years or more before Christ, and it's still in existence now, then it would have existed during the time of the New Testament writers. And they seemingly made some reference to the thought. Start with 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4 talks about how Paul tells Timothy he is to teach no other doctrine but only that which has been revealed. But in verse 4, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Now, there's a great deal of question among commentators. What is that? Some think it has reference to Jewish uh, endless genealogies. Maybe it does. Some think it has reference to this Gnostic thought of, of the eons or the emanations of all the intermediates between God and matter. And some think perhaps the fables may even uh, the, uh, have reference to some Gnostic thought. I'll leave that for you to judge. That may have reference to Gnostic thought. Let's go to chapter 1 and in verse 20. Again, I'm just putting out the thought that perhaps I think one particular passage no doubt has reference to Gnostic thought that we'll get to here in 1 Timothy, but others may perhaps allude to that concept. Let's go to chapter 1 and in verse 20. He mentions some having... Uh, made shipwreck of the faith, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Well, I don't know what they thought. But it seems in light of the second letter, 2 Timothy, that there was a denial of the resurrection, which the Gnostics would have denied. Were they the only ones? No, they weren't the only ones. But that may have had reference, and these may have very well have been those who were influenced by Gnostic thought. Maybe some other thought. I just pass that on for what that may be worth. Let's go to another passage that seems to get even a little closer. In chapter 4 and in verse 3, there were those who would forbid to marry and command to abstain from meats. Now, why, why were they doing that? Well, perhaps from, from Jewish thought, that could be the case. But it could be from this asceticism of the Gnostic thought. It doesn't mean that those who bought into that were full-fledged Gnostics, but they could have been influenced by Gnosticism. And let me footnote here. Not everyone who believes in some form of Calvinism buys the whole system. Well, the same thing here. Not everyone who holds to some form of Gnostic thought buys the whole system. 
So it could be that some were influenced by this, and so they, there is a form of asceticism, of, of extreme self-denial. We're going to deny ourselves of marriage and of eating of meat because, again, all matter is evil. The more obvious one is chapter 6 and in verse 20. In fact, anything I read just about on Gnosticism or have been reading in the last few days will make reference, if it doesn't make reference to any other text, for, to 1 Timothy 6 and in verse 20. Well, let's see what 1 Timothy 6 and verse 20 Paul warns Timothy to guard that which is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and contradiction of what is falsely called gnosis or knowledge. Well, I don't know if anything better describes Gnosticism than that which is falsely called Gnosticism, knowledge, people with knowledge, than those who deny Jesus is, the, is in the flesh. They deny creation and they deny the resurrection and they... On down the line we go, said all matter is evil. They claim to have superior knowledge. You have no way of knowing what they know. And so he talks about what is falsely called knowledge. Probably, most likely, a reference to the Gnostic thought. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 16 to 18. Several writers in talking about Gnosticism identify these men that are identified here. Uh, Hamanius and Philetus as being Gnostics themselves. The term Gnostic is not used in this context, but let's see what he says. Beginning at verse 16, 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, which will increase to more ungodliness. Now Paul had said that earlier, talking about the knowledge falsely so-called. And their message will spread like a cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. What were they saying? Saying they have strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection is already past. So it's a denial of the resurrection, which they did, and overthrow the faith of some. Were they Gnostics? I don't know. Were they influenced by Gnosticism? Perhaps. Um, but that seems to allude to at least a concept or, or a part of the Gnostic thought. Let's go to the book of Colossians. Now, before we go to Colossians, I just want to suggest this is the reason I was asked to deal with this, because we're dealing with 1 Timothy. And what is this idea that may be alluded to in these passages? This is the Gnostic thought that we're talking about. So let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, Colossians 2 deals more specifically with this asceticism, this extreme self-denial, even at times abuse of the human body. Chapter 2 and verse 20 to 23, he said, Therefore you have died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all things concerning... Uh, which all con, uh, concern things which perish in the using and according to the commandments and the doctrines of men. Well, that was asceticism. Was it driven from Gnosticism? Perhaps. I'll leave it at that. Can I say 100% sure this was Gnostic thought he was talking about and not some other doctrine that had asceticism as a part of that? I can't. But I can say that that very likely could be a Gnostic thought that he was dealing with. Now let's go to 1 John. Uh, most writers who study 1 John and comment upon 1 John will talk about how that John seems to be addressing some implications or tentacles of Gnosticism in 1 John. Now, we've already alluded, we, before we go to chapter 4, I mentioned chapter 3 a moment ago, and it's not on the screen, but I'll mention it here again. In 1 John chapter 3, the, the point being made, the children of God don't continue in sin. Well, now, if all matter is evil and you hold to the idea that God doesn't really care what I'm doing because I can't help it, I'm all matter and the flesh is evil, and I, I, whatever I do, anything in the flesh does is evil, then why not go ahead and sin? And so we've already noted, chapter 3 and in verse 6, that whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. That's interesting that he uses the word know. That if you practice sin, you don't know God. And so you claim to have superior knowledge, very likely he's alluding to the principle of Gnosticism. Chapter 4 now, in verses 1 to 3, uh, uh, John addresses the concept that says Jesus did not come in the flesh. He said, try the spirits, whether they be of God, for many false prophets are gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Well, Gnostics said he was not come in the flesh. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Uh, 
Now, notice it, in, uh, that continues on down through verse 6, actually, instead of just through verse 3. But I just wanted you to see this idea that here was a doctrine of denying the deity of Christ, that he came in the, denying that he came in the flesh. He addresses that, seemingly alluding to the concept of Gnosticism. One more I'll mention, and then we'll move to our last point. 2 John, beginning at verse 7 through verse 9, again he alludes to the idea that there are many deceivers gone into the world that do not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh. And you pick up 10 commentaries and read about what, what is this all about. Half of them at least, if not more, if not 80% of them will say this probably alludes to Gnostic thought. And probably so. Now that's not an exhaustive list. Perhaps there are others. I'm just giving you a flavor that the Bible does address what seemingly has reference to Gnostic tentacles. Now I want to be brief here because in uh, an interest of time, but also the fact that I, I really don't have a whole lot to say about Gnosticism today, though more could be said. What about Gnosticism today? And I want to suggest to you that Gnosticism is not dead because the doctrines associated with Gnosticism are not dead. And so this is not beating a dead horse in the sense that this was an old doctrine that has not risen up any uh, since the New Testament times. No one believes that. No one holds to that. In fact, it's a doctrine that's very much alive. The denial of creation is the very same concept that the Gnostics had. And so those who deny the creation, God could not have done that directly, but he did it over millions of years, is basically similar to the idea of the Gnostic thought. So this is not a, we're, we're dealing with much of the same kind of thing in our present day. There's the denial of the deity of Christ. There's the denial of the resurrection. There is the denial of, of the resurrection in the end of time by the doctrine of reincarnation. There's the doctrine of feminism. And on we could go. So is, is feminism out there? Sure. Is, is reincarnation being taught? Absolutely. Are all these doctrines being taught? Yes. And so the tentacles of Gnostics, Gnosticism, is out there. It's very much alive. And so we may not know it as Gnosticism, but the doctrine is still there. One of the things that kind of created a resurging interest in that was the Da Vinci Code that came out in 2003 as a book and then later as a movie. And got people interested in the fact that what are these, these writings uh, that were found in 1945? And what, what are found in these Gnostic Gospels? And so there was kind of a renewed interest in that. The New Age movement, we don't have time to go into, is very much alive today, which involves reincarnation, is one of their doctrines. I want to close with this quotation from Bo Kirkwood. The Kirkwood said that we live in the New Age society. The New Age thought permeates the arts, music, literature, and religion. We live in a time where mysticism has em is embraced by many, and the Bible no longer is considered the standard of authority. When the Bible is out and the New Age movement is influencing our music and our art and our literature, and it, and it is greatly, then we have the tentacles of Gnosticism alive and well today. Well, I hope that helps you. That helps me a little bit to do that a little bit of research, and all we've done is kind of hit the, the, the hem of the garment on that. That's just kind of an introductory thought to Gnosticism. That is certainly not in depth, and you may want to delve into that much deeper than that, but we've raised the question, what is Gnosticism, and what did they teach? Where are references to the concepts found in the New Testament, and then seeing that it is much alive in our own present day? There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and sing?